everybody. Welcome to my talk today, preparing for your first nursing placement. And I've been asked by lots of first year students just to do some practical tips to help them because they're starting their degree. And I hope you find it useful. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel for lots more free videos and hopefully we'll go on this journey together. There's lots of videos for newly registered nurses. So I'll see you at the other end when you're registered, hopefully. And if you've got any comments or anything else you want me to cover, do put them in the YouTube channel comments. So the first thing I wanted to say was, well done, you managed to get your, through your interview and your personal statement and you've done really well to get on your nursing course. And I'm sure lots of you are feeling really excited, not quite sure what's going to happen. And that's absolutely normal. So many first year students get really worried about placement and university life and um, the main thing is that you talk to other people, talk to other students. There's lots of tips I'm going to give you today. You're going to learn so much over the next few years and just enjoy it. Try and enjoy it as well. There'll be lots of ups and downs. It's not easy. It's not an easy degree, but it's an amazing profession to go into and you will have achieved so much at the end. So I hope I see you at the end on your journeys. So I'm going to give you lots of practical tips and I'll talk about prior to placement, the first day of placement, which people always worry about during your placement and just a few tips if you are struggling or if you've got any concerns. So one thing I, I'm suggesting you all do, and I used to do this because I used to be a tutor of first year students, is to document how you feel at the start and I used to get all my first years to do this and they could just write a few words down or do it as a collage an art collage or write a poem or record some audio or just use photos but try and record how you feel I didn't this is a photo of me though and it brings back lots of memories when I started my nurse training it wasn't a degree then and it was in the 1980s so you can see me with my hat and I remember a really quiet shy person who didn't even know if nursing was for them I always say nursing found me I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do but I really really enjoyed it once I started so what's really good is if you write down how you feel at the start you can look back when you're a second or a third year, you might be struggling with an assignment or your dissertation, but you can really see when you near to registering how far you've come and that really boosts your motivation. And it could be very, you'll feel very different from when you're just starting out and you won't believe how much you've achieved, all those knowledge and skills that you've achieved during your programme. So it's a really helpful thing to do. Prior to placement, one key tip, because you're bombarded with quite a lot of information, you've got your placement information and you'll have all your university module and programme handbooks, is just to write down key people and contacts who can support you. And you're going to have contacts for university and contacts during placements. And where possible, it's helpful to have a telephone number, but also an email. And in university, I would say some key people are the placement lead for university. And that's usually the person that will send the email of which, which placement you're going to, or that will coordinate the placements. You've got your degree programme lead, and you've also got your personal tutors. And I used to be a personal tutor, and I used to teach on first, second, and third year modules. The personal tutor is the person that will follow you through the whole of the degree, from, from when you first start to when you register and they'll write your an academic reference, for example, but they're there to support you with any worries or concerns that you've got. And then you've got your module leads that you might talk to, but these key people here are, are really helpful throughout your degree. And then in placement, you've got practice supervisor who oversees, who'll be working with you, observing what you do and looking at um, signing off your proficiencies with the practice assessor who's checking the achievement overall. 
So you've got these two key people and the practice supervisor will be your role model and your person that we, you'll be linked to for the whole of the placement. Whereas the practice assessor will um, oversee um, the placement but won't, let, won't necessarily be in the practice area. Some of them might be, but some of them might not be. And the employer will also have a structure for where, wherever you um, are in placement, there'll be a structure for management and for um, a leadership team. So you might have a team leader, you, they might be called a sister or a charge nurse or a manager. And then you've got matron, you might have clinical educators, you might have a lead nurse and an education lead as well. And it's really helpful just to have uh, some names and, and you can often get them on the intranet, either in the university or in the uh, with the employer. Because if your practice supervisor goes off sick or you've got an issue or a concern, and you're not quite sure what you do, or where to get your rotors, then you've always got somebody else you can go to. There's always somebody that you can escalate further on to. So it's helpful to have a list of names. Prior to placement, the first thing you'll be doing is introducing yourself and contacting the placement. And the university will let you know which placement area and should give you some names um, telephone number, email to contact your placement. And it's really helpful to introduce yourself. And if you don't hear back, you can phone again or email or escalate to whoever's above that person. So sometimes I'm asked, what do I say? So I've just written some narrative here. So you might say, hi, my name is Carol, and I'm a first year student due to start on the, your oncology ward on the 1st of April and I'm contacting you to introduce myself and to request my rota. I'm really looking forward to meeting staff on the oncology ward and you can contact me by and then you can say how you want to be contacted. And when I used to be a lecturer practitioner, so I used to look after the students when they first came and I do orientations and I always used to contact students before they contacted me and often they'd ring back and they wouldn't leave a contact telephone and I, I wouldn't always have their email. So don't forget to leave your contact telephone or your email because it's very easy done that you don't. So once you've done your introductions, you will be looking at arranging an informal visit. So you need to contact the area to see if you can do your visit a week beforehand or you might be contacted by the placement area to attend on a certain day. And it's usually a week or two weeks before you start, but a week's usually about average. And um, when I was a lecturer practitioner, I would invite first, second and third years together, for example, to do a walk round together because the orientation to the area is very similar and get you be able to get your rotors then. So look out for your informal visit, either be proactive or you may be invited. And during your informal visits or when you send your email to, um, or you phone the to introduce yourself, you need to ask about shifts usually first of all. And shifts um, can be 12 day, 12 days, um, 12 hour shifts where it might you might start at seven in the morning to seven in the evening or 7.30 to 7.30 and then you'll have a night shift um, from 7.30 to 7.30 again. You might have shorter shifts where you have an early or a late. It might be an eight hour shift, for example, starting at 7.30 to 3.30. And they're different across employers, but they, they're very, just very slightly different usually. And then you can also ask about changing room facilities, where you go on your first day and staff room so you can bring some food and drink in and security pass, which I'll talk about in a minute, key contacts in the team, and importantly, who do you contact if you're sick or unable to attend placement? And it's really important that you give an, a good impression when you start a placement, that you're reliable, you turn up on time, and that if you can't get into a placement, that you 
ring in um, and you use the, the correct process for ringing in and letting the staff know because your practice supervisor could be waiting at handover for you to be coming in and so they need to know if you're not turning up. You might want to know about parking, if there is a parking permit and staff parking, or you might need to use park and ride, anything you're worried about, so any other questions. And you might want to do a trial run on the travel to do check the timings yourself if you're not quite sure or look on Google Maps or other apps are available. So security and employer induction. So we you'd be in, inducted and there'd be um, usually invite from the university placement lead will let you know when your induction is locally and where to collect your uniform and your student ID badge. And you'll also be given details to collect a local security pass. For example, if you um, work in a hospital trust, many of the hospital wards have um, a locked and you have a keypad locker to get in or you have to use your iPad, your um, badge to get in as a security pass, for example. Um, and this, you know, in nursing homes or you'll be in a wide variety of placements, but often they require a security pass and you might have to collect that from the local area. Another thing to ask about is lockers. So students, um, you might have access to lockers and you might have to pay a small deposit and then to, to have your locker during placement and then you get your deposit back after. But whatever you do, don't bring high valuable items into work um, because nowadays so many things can get stolen anywhere um, and it's in a public place. So just don't bring anything valuable into work. Uniform you must always check your local uniform policy and you might be wearing a tunic and trousers for example you might wear scrubs if you're in theatres or you might even wear your own clothes so for example if you were a mental health student the uniform can cause a barrier between you and your patient or client and you um, so you, you might be able to wear your own clothes and also you might be invited to a local study day as a student that the staff are attending and you might not you know you might need you might be able to just wear your own clothes when you're looking at um, the uniform policy it usually advises you about washing but I put some advice here this is linked to national advice as well so washing temperature would be 10 minutes at 60 degrees um, should remove almost all microorganisms so it's quite a hot wash and um, you're really aiming to prevent transmission of infection with your uniform and I'll talk a bit later about uniform as well. Um, no false nails though, no nail varnish because your false nails can drop off and if for example you're dressing a wound you could be causing an infection if your nail varnish flakes, for example. So there's the science behind um, the uniform policies and lanyards. So I've got my lanyard. A lanyard is, is what you put your badge on there. So I've put that around my neck like that, for example, when I'm going in. And but you shouldn't be wearing these when you're delivering direct care to a person because the lanyard bit can harbour germs. So you'd have to take it off and put it in your pocket, for example. Um, and lanyards are, may, might not be allowed in certain with certain employers. And um, the other thing is, if you've got this round your neck, um, patients can pull. So if somebody had dementia, for example, and it was round your neck, they could potentially pull you your neck. So again, it's to do with safety. So do check your local uniform policy. Think about public perceptions as well. Um, no smoking in uniform and you shouldn't be wearing your uniform when you're shopping, for example. And, you, you know, sometimes the public will take photos of nurses in their uniform and the public perceive there to be this transmission of infection when you're in your uniform. So you shouldn't be wearing it. Um, in shopping public areas. Prior to placement, it's always helpful to do some pre-reading and practice supervisors expect you to have a little bit of an idea about the area that you're 
um, going to for placement. So it might be an acute care area, rehabilitation, long term care area. It could have a specialist field linked to the area. Whichever field of nursing you're in, there may be um, some pre-reading and anatomy and physiology or some reading around the specialist area if it's mental health. It might be addiction services, for example. So you can do some reading. It's don't go to to, to don't try and do too much though because you've got so much on your plate when you first start the practice supervisors do not expect you to to um know as much and they know that you're going to be nervous when you first start a good area to look at is the nmc code because the nmc code will link to a lot of your first year proficiencies and also our staff and student on forums. You've got Twitter, student Twitter forums and Facebook forums. There's some fantastic forums out there. Um, we Student Nurses, the Student Nurse Project, um, the RCN Newly Registered Nurses. They've all got Facebook and Twitter forums. So I hope I haven't missed one major one out. Um, and they're really helpful to direct your reading and uh, and often I see students on there saying I'm going to, to placement in ophthalmology what would be good reading and you'll always get fantastic feedback from other students which is lovely to see or newly registered nurses or experienced nurses so another um, thing you might want to do is the British National Formulary is, is our medication handbook basically for all healthcare professionals so it'll have all the medication drug actions the types of drugs the side effects and there's also a mobile app that you can get of the British National Formulary so that's helpful that will see you through all of your um, your course and you've also in every area the pharmacist will put out British National Formulary um, books and they are updated every year and it, but the mobile app will be continually updated because it's an online resource and, and there are medications that do change and they might withdraw certain medications. So it's helpful to have the mobile app because it's the most up to date or always look at the current BNF to make sure that your data is up to date. Clinical skills online. So you've got clinicalskills.net and there's other online um, uh, places, rec online um, resources recommended often through your universities and library. So there's some helpful tips for pre-reading there. What to bring on your first day. So usually with your uniform policies, if you've got to wear a uniform, it should be black or navy shoes. They should be wipeable. They're wipeable because you will have all sorts on your shoes. You may have feces on there. You may have urine on there or sputum, vomit. And it isn't nice if you have holes in your shoes. So look at your uniform policy, but they um, should be wipeable. They should have a soft sole. The reason for that is if you're on night shifts or on a late and the patient's asleep, that um, you're not making a lot of noise to, to, to um, disturb patients. And also for comfort, it's helpful to have a soft sole. And your feet should be enclosed. If you're drawing up injections as well, um, it's dangerous if a needle potentially can fall on, on the foot and you've got crocs on, for example. Um, so do adhere to that policy. You should be clean and tidy. And if you come in with really dirty uniform, for example, because you're wash, you know, you wash your uniforms yourself and bring them in, unless you work in theatres in scrubs where you, you don't, you put them in linen baskets. So um, but you need to be clean and tidy, short nails, because if you are with a patient and you are helping them when they're moving with manual handling, you can scratch patients. So um, you shouldn't be able to see your nails. Above. So if you put your hands out, that you shouldn't be able to see the nails above the tops of your fingers, for example. And um, you hair should be tied up off the collar and bare below the um, elbow. Again, that links to the transmission of bugs and germs and har you harbour lots of pathogens on your wrists and piercings should be sil simple studs and no rings except your wedding ring. And you'll have to look at your policies for tattoos 
as well and for um, hair colour most employers are fine with hair being brightly coloured but you do have to check with some employers and tattoos I'd say again most employers are fine um you know it, it's it's more if it's an offensive tattoo it would need you need to redo your tattoo um or cover it up but you wouldn't be allowed to have offensive tattoos in um in practice but most employers are fine with tattoos other bits um black pens don't have expensive pens and because everyone asks can I borrow a pen in practice you'll lose so many pens so get don't you don't go buying expensive pens you can't use fountain pens they need to be black because um, black is the best for photocopying and if you use blue pen it can fade and it's not good with photocopying and there may be legal documents that need to be photocopied and that's standard for all medical professionals um, you should bring in some fluid for you to make sure you have some drinks in the day. However, you should be able to buy food and to have um, fluid in the area. There should be access to water in the area. Um, and But um, if you're on a late, for example, and canteens are shut, you might need to bring in your own food. And that's why when you go to your inductions, it's helpful to see if there's a microwave or a fridge, for example water bottle and if you're in the community for example you might not be able to go back to the office you might be able to for lunch but there'll be you know it's good to have your own lunches and and fluids in case you're out and about hand sanitizer and cream so some people like to bring their own hand sanitizer and cream but again employers should provide hand sanitizer um, and I have really strong hand cream that I use and your hands um, may get quite sore when you first start I used to um, we used to have what was called heavy scrub years ago and it was like this pink stuff that was really really strong and my hands often would be red raw especially around my knuckles and I used to use very strong thick um, hand cream so um, do be aware that your hands may become quite sore what to bring on your first day um, you're not allowed wrist watches so some students like to have um, their fob watch or um, either on their um, uniform or in their pocket and pen torch again sometimes you can buy your own pen torch that are quite good quality when you put batteries in Employers should provide pen torches if you need them and you use pen torches for shining in patients eyes when you do neurological observations. Um, if you're on night shift, sometimes it's nice to have a, a torch as well. But as I said, employers should provide those. Um, but if you want a really good quality one, you can buy them yourself. A notebook. You might want a little notebook to write medical terms or a nursing term that you're not quite sure of you need a calendar for your shift so you might have that on your phone or you might have a diary for example so remember to bring those in one thing to remember though is you mustn't put anything about patients in your notebooks you have to adhere to the nmc code for confidentiality and although you can reflect on care and practice you mustn't put things in notebooks because if they're left down accidentally and you go to the canteen where a patient goes in potentially people might be um, um, you might be able to identify somebody so the notebooks are really just for writing medical or nursing terms that you need to know about and for your learning we are moving over to electronic patient records and so writing notes on paper will become obsolete anyway eventually but you may see some areas have got paper handover sheets they must be shredded before you leave the area and that's a big tip for you i wouldn't want any of you getting into trouble um, because that has confidential data on your handover sheets and the you'll probably see policies with you, your employers but um just to be aware of that, that you don't leave them around anywhere so the public can pick up a handover sheet. The first day, what to expect? Be punctual, aim for 20, 30 minutes even before your shift and you might want a cup of tea, you want to sit down, say hello to people for your first shift. And if you're late, you may miss handover and important updates. So as I said earlier, it's really important to be punctual. Now, if you have 
a disaster and something's happened, do not worry and get really upset. Just go in and apologise. We're all human and it life can throw things at us. But consistent being um, not being punctual consistently, you were not going to be signed off for professionalism. So a one off is fine. But if it keeps happening, your practice supervisors will probably have a word and ask what's going on. Um, and it's not fair on the busy placement areas where they've allocated a practice supervisor to work with you. Um, and as I said, you'll miss important updates with introductions. When you come in on your first day, um, be proactive. So introduce yourself. And again, that's helpful if you don't arrive just as they're doing handover, because everybody will be concentrating on the handover. If you come in a bit early, you can say hello to people and you're bound to get somebody that will say, oh, don't worry, I'll come and introduce you to other people. If you're there a bit earlier, it's a really good tip to get there early. And your handover will be specific to the speciality and field. There are some areas that do audio, taped handovers. Um, most areas, they, they might put it up on a screen, for example, if it's electronic patient records, and they might do like a digital handover. Others will have paper handover sheets. And as I said, they will eventually become obsolete. Um, Another thing to think about is you're going to feel really tired. It's normal on your first day. So do look after yourself and try not to overcommit on that first placement because you'll be so surprised. I remember even when I, I mean, I'm tired every day in my 50s now, um, but you'll be really surprised how tired you get. And I remember as a first year placement and I'd come home and be start nodding off at eight o'clock nine o'clock um because i'd be so shattered and i also with me i tended to catch a lot of bugs because your immune system is getting used to the different areas and when i was an adult nurse we had to spend time in mental health and children's nursing and i remember when i was in children's nursing for the first month i must have been off about five times catching illnesses um from these little children diarrhea and vomiting, for example. But if you're sick, you're sick because you you mustn't feel guilty about taking time off if you're not well. Um, it could be your mental health. It could be your physical health because you don't do any favours, especially if you've got a bug that you're going to pass on to somebody. You could potentially put a patient at risk if their immune system's depressed. So if you're in an oncology ward and patients are having chemotherapy and you're going in with a bug, you know, it can potentially be very harmful for that patient. And um, so, so do be careful of that and, and don't try um, and do too much for that first. So key tips really are don't try to do too much and you're going to be led by your practice supervisor and the experienced nurses in the team. Get to know all levels of the team right down from the cleaner, the ward clerk, if you're on a ward, the secretaries, they're all going to be really helpful because a lot of them will have so much knowledge about where stuff is stored and where um, to go to um, for advice. I've done a talk on support worker roles to registered nurse. So in England, for example, we've got the nursing associate role, which is a band four role. So it's important to know what these um, what the different roles do. And you'll have um, allied health professionals, you'll have medics, you'll have physios, OTs, dieticians, so many different people that you can work with um, and that you will get to know. So it's really helpful um, over a period of time. You don't have to do it straight away just to ask people, what do you do? And um, in your role and can I maybe spend some time shadowing you don't ever ever be afraid to ask questions but do think about your timing so if a patient starting to deteriorate or is really poorly mentally physically with their health um, it might not be the right time to start bombarding your practice supervisor with lots of questions um, but do don't be afraid to ask questions but do think about that and you're going to be really for your first place in observing, listening and just try to be proactive and ask questions, as I said, and use those opportunities. Um, your sign off proficiencies are really important on every placement and you're going to be getting used to the paperwork. If you 
um, have time prior to placement, have a look at the NMC platforms of proficiency. So there's platforms of proficiency for nursing associates and for registered nurses. There's six for nursing associates in England and seven for registered nurses. And you can have a look at um, what's to come in the future because you'll be looking at leading care, for example, um, as a registered nurse. But you will, for your first placement, you're really going to be focusing on personal care, on assessments and so mental health assessments, um, observations, if it's um, depending on your area, looking at fluids, dietary needs of patients, how you communicate and develop your relationship with your patient, your, your client. You're looking at person centred care, so looking holistically at the biological, psychological, social and spiritual needs of, of um, the individual, looking at working across the teams, looking at quality and safety and evidence based care. So um, your all of your placements and your sign off will be linking to those proficiencies. So it's helpful to bring in your practice assessment sign off documentation. So if you've got a locker, for example, you might uh, leave it in the placement area. And so it's always there when you've got that opportunity to have a sign off um, on a proficiency and book future review dates in advance is really helpful as well. And it's quite good to set those when you've got some time, whenever you're sat with your practice supervisor at the beginning, to set the review dates for the rest of the placement and have their email and contact so that if it gets cancelled, we've got so many cancellations everywhere now with people isolating with COVID, that it's helpful to have those review dates. Another tip is what do you do if your practice supervisor is sick? or has a bereavement or for whatever reason is suddenly not there. You should have another person allocated, but if you've worked across an area and you're near to your final review, it's always helpful to have worked with more than just your practice supervisor, that to, to have talked to other people in the team who have seen you working and observed you working. So you have um, that option as well, rather than just focusing on the one person. So it's just as a tip, really. Your, some key tips to focus your learning. You'll be led by your patients or clients. People like to use different terms in different areas and your use of a person centred approach to focus your learning. So I used to say I used to work in neurosciences and I would um, get the students or newly registered nurses to focus on one area um, that they were interested in and but link it to patients that they would cared for. So, for example, if they would cared for somebody with Parkinson's disease that week, they might look up what causes Parkinson's disease, the side effects and um, the uh, medica of medications, um, the tests that you have for Parkinson's disease, what the symptoms and signs and symptoms are, but also look at a holistic approach. Go and sit with your patient and ask them how um, their illness or condition has affected their life psychologically, socially, and um, go very much from um, listen to their story and, and how they feel about being in a hospital or the, linking it to discharge, for example, as well. I'm doing it from a very hospital based um, example there, but the same in the community. And if you're led by your patients, it will really mean you'll remember it because you're going to remember what you've learnt. If you see a patient with certain symptoms that you've um, cared for that week, you're going to remember because you've cared for that patient. If you um, have taken them for some tests or you've, you've had to give them certain medications and you see the symptoms of the shaking that they might have with Parkinson's disease, then that'll be you'll remember it and how it's affected them as a person at home. And another key tip is to review patient leaflets. So it, whenever you go to any area, be it community setting or any field, often you'll see patient information leaflets and they're simple language and they're easy to understand because they have to be because um, patients have to read them. And um, they are helpful for, as a start because they'll have lots of simple information. And I used to find those really helpful when I was a student and when I was first starting out. 
talk to the pharmacist um, they can give you a printout of regular medications because many students have got their um, OSCE and um, skills assessment for medication and um, the, a pharmacist for uh, in a specialist area will have a printout of medications and you can talk to them about um, different aspects of medications um, administration and if you do have some spare time so if the practice supervisor says look I'm too busy today um, this morning I've got to um, do some uh, be in charge of a bleep for example for a floor that you've got some key reading or additional spare time use it wisely so if you've got an assignment bring some of your articles in so that if you do get some spare time that you can um, use it to, to do some reading for example and you're using your time wisely um, accessing opportunities so look at the local resources Many employers now on their int local intranets have access to online libraries, so um, you'll be able to have access, hopefully, to um, staff study days as well, which will be open to students. Some might not be, but many will be. So you can be proactive, and if there's a clinical educator or a manager in an area, you can ask, Could, oh, that sounds really interesting, are students allowed to attend? If they are, go and talk to other students so you support each other. Um, and have a look at um, key policies and guidelines they will be on document stores and that will link to a lot of your initial competencies where of proficiency sorry where you're looking at infection control for example and medicines um, administration and network with specialist nurses advanced nurse practitioners clinical educators as i said there's some all these specialist nurse roles and um, allied health professionals and other students. You might have second and third year students. So ask them about their experiences and what what helped them at in university as well as placement. And they might have lots of tips they can help you with. Always, always ask for help if you're struggling and you're feeling overwhelmed. You're not alone. Always let somebody know. And it's been really hard with the pandemic because I know a lot of students have had less face to face. I mean, we're coming back to having more face to face time, but um, it's it's been hard for everybody, for lecturers, for university staff and but especially for students, because where you used to have your seminar groups over the last two years, there's been a lot more virtual learning at home. So placement staff are always there to help you. And um, as I said, the previous slide with contacts, access support and always prioritise your physical and mental health. Um, what's helpful is to use your calendar to book time off as well. So you always have some time for you that you have off in the week that you just even if you just sleep or you just read a book or whatever you want to do to relax, that you book some time off and um, it will help you. A calendar will help you with planning your assignments, for example, so that you can try and do break your the workload into chunks. So you're not trying to do it all the night before. Um, request extensions as well if you have mitigating circumstances sooner rather than later. So in your first placement, um, if you have had to have time off the sickness, you sometimes people remember to let the placement area know, but forget to tell the university. If you tell your placement lead or your um, personal tutor that you've had to have three weeks off at the beginning of placement, you can potentially get extensions to your placement hours. And it's much better to do it earlier rather than later. Ask for help and support. So um, when you're looking at those leads that I mentioned on the first slide, so you've got your practice supervisor and assessor, and then you'll have a clinical team leader or manager. If you're worried about something and your practice supervisor isn't there, go to the clinical team leader or the manager. That's why I said it's helpful to have those names at the start of a placement. If you can't get a resolution on something, you haven't got your shifts or um, the team leaders off sick as well or the manager, go to the matron 
or the head of education. In university, you might go to the learning environment lead or the university placement lead, your personal tutor. And then if, this, if you can't, if you don't have access to those people, the programme director, your degree programme lead, the head of school, and then above that would be the university dean. And if you've got something that you're really not happy with and you haven't, don't feel it's been resolved, you must follow the escalation. So you've escalated to all of those people. So hopefully it will be resolved. But if you still felt it wasn't resolved, there will be um, quality and standard teams linked to the NHS or wherever, whichever region you're in. So in England, it's Health Education England. There'll be a regional lead for an, an area lead that you can email. So my final message, enjoy your placement, your first placement, you'll remember um, when you finish and I still remember mine. Keep connected with other students and all the people that are there to support you that I've highlighted in this talk and good luck. I wish you every success. If you do want to contact me, you can contact me on my website or DM me on Twitter or Instagram. And as I said earlier, do put any comments or questions that you have in the comments box.